I get asked probably four or five times a month this question, and I'm going to do my best to answer this question that I can. I get asked four or five times a month, is there a book out there that I can go buy that will allow me to start to learn how to work on amplifiers? The short, long, drawn-out answer that I'm going to give to that is yes and no. Now I'm going to do this in a, in a different kind of format. I'm going to show you where I started from as far as like books. I'm going to talk about the pros and the things that I learned from each one of these books and the cons. So my first piece of actual paper book literature that I actually owned. When I was a kid, I had to get on my bike and I had to ride for two hours. It seemed like it was probably about 40 minutes and I had to go to the public library. And I had to pray that the person that had checked out the ARRL hand manual book had returned it and I could check it out and bring it home for a week. And that was back when you had to pay like five cents per photocopy and I, I grew up incredibly poor, like beyond poor. I no money for these things. And nobody in my family got my passion for radio. No one. And very little to foster it. It was everything I had to do on my own. Now, the skills that I got from that growing up incredibly poor were I would have to go to somebody else's house that had a bunch of garbage, what they considered to be their garbage, and I'd dig it out of their garbage pile, and then I had to go home and learn how to take it all apart and clean everything and figure out what did what and then put it back together and make it work and then make it new again. Those skills... Learning, learning life that way, growing up broke, um, that skill set I think has paid off a little bit in life, but I digress. The very first amateur or any kind of handbook or knowledge book I had was this thing here. This is the 2010 ARRL handbook, and in this book they discuss a lot of different theories and forums. This is a good reference guide for certain things. Now, each one of these little post-its refers to something that has something to do with amplification or has something to do with um, component operation. About two-thirds of this book have nothing to do with this job. They're all about different rules and different protocols and different procedures and why certain things are the way they are in the amateur radio community. But it's a motley mix of knowledge. This book also has got different projects in it that you can build. Um, this particular book has got a really good section on a 3CX 1500, which is a great little tiny uh, ceramic metal bodied tube that uh, was very helpful. It's also got a, a, a very, very uh, short section about solid state amplification. But a lot of this is rules and a lot of this is different procedures and operations. And there's a little bit of basic antenna theory and stuff that's in here that you need to learn to be able to get your amateur license. Handbooks are very knowledgeable, very fun filled, if that's your kind of dry reading. But this was my Bible for a long time. So this is where we started. So that I get into this business a little bit further, and I hear tellings that there's what they call master manuals that are internally printed circulations of things in different companies. And in the day, there was one major, um, and, and you gotta remember, I'm coming from this, from the solid state point of view, okay? As a kid, um, the solid state components made more sense to me to play with than the tubes and that nobody wanted to turn me loose with tubes until I got to be about 14 because they were afraid I was going to electrocute myself, which is probably some good stuff. My, my, my schooling officially started when I met this guy by the name of Mike Cope. He was a crazy, greasy, showered once a week if he needed it or not kind of guy. Lived in a trailer literally down by the river. He had 12 cats. And his idea of emptying the cat box was literally walking. He, he lived on a couple acres of property. He'd take his cat box, he would walk to one end of his trailer and dump it out on the ground. It was 
disgusting. The guy was gross. But that man had forgotten more about radio than pretty much anybody in my town at that time. And so he was the one I went and sought out for knowledge, and he's the one that started teaching me about things. I've referenced him many, many, many times. He always told me that there were handbooks out there that I could go find that had every solid state RF design in them, and they were put together by engineers, real engineers. This is uh, Rev, Rev, uh, Rev 4 of this book, so it's on his first fourth print, fourth renovation of this book. God, man, people. Fourth rev of this book. And this particular copy of the book, the only reason I brought it out was because it was gifted to me by Mark at Rainmaker Customs. I told him about this set of series of manuals. He went out and he bought a set for himself. And he bought me one and sent it to me as a gift. And so I'm bringing that out on camera and I'm showing it. He even signed it signed it himself. Thanks Luke Miller, thanks for Remaker Customs, okay? In here, in this book, is all of their transistor design and suggested board layouts for those particular components. And they give you examples of, I'm just going to randomly pick one when I see a picture of it. This is for a very high frequency, but they give you actual board prints, what it should look like, where you need to put the component, and they explain to you the different op operating principles for the different devices, okay? And how they work and why they're in the circuit as far as solid state goes. This is some dry reading. It's worse than the Gideon Bible. It is very hard to digest, and usually what I use this for... Usually what I use this for here is for me to pull it out, go look up some obscure transistor, look at the board design, and then translate that over to something that I have sitting in front of me. This is the RF device data book number two. It's just my opinion. I have no factual knowledge of this taking place, but some of the bigger manufacturers that are back east um, that were real innovators in the 80s and the 90s, I am a firm belief, firm, firm belief that most of what they learned or how they went about you know, implementing the full copper clap boards and all that stuff came from volume number two. The reason for that is this is the section that covers some of the HF components that we use. They took that knowledge that they learned in this book they washed it a little bit and boiled it down to its basic underlying principles. I firmly believe it came from this manual. Some of that knowledge. Not all, but some. This is the RF device guidebook. This is part cross-reference and also a master index of Motorola components at the time. It's handy because you can go and you can look up, let's say, like the MRF 455 or something. You can look that up, and it's also going to say, has shares characteristics, and then it lists off all the other components that Motorola makes that cross with that particular device, that, and there's more board designs in here. Um, a lot of them are leaning themselves towards the higher frequencies for communications, but there's a neat section in here about tuned cavities that I really enjoyed. Volume number two, just saying set these aside, set those over here. Now let me say this, there is no school that is in existence anymore that I am aware of. And if I am wrong, please somebody call and tell me about it because I'd like to go experience that. If there is a transmitter school that is still in existence in the United States that I can go pay money and attend and roll and get some kind of degree I want to go there and I want to go to that school because there is going to be shit there that I'm going to learn at that school that I'm not going to be able to get here from my observational science that I have. Okay? There is no school that you can go to as far as my knowledge allows me to have in my head to where I can go and learn how to build transmitters or specific, specific to, I mean you can go get your electrical engineering degree, that's great. 
Um, some of the basic principles in that do get applied to this, a lot of them do, but until you actually go do, I mean, that a lot of that stuff would be, you're going to go get your electrical engineering degree, okay, or you're going to go get a BS in uh, electrical sciences or whatever. When you get to the company, like, let's say, just Harris, we'll say, you're going to have a lot of in-service time and in-service classes where you're going to learn by doing and applying those principles. That's the school I want to go to. As far as I know, that hasn't existed since the 80s. I mean, maybe they got something like that in China. I don't know if I'd go to China to go to that school, but if there's something in the United States, I'd really like to find it. And maybe, maybe just maybe, but I mean, putting this on the inner boob, there might be a guy out there that knows about that that can help share that knowledge with me. Remember, I live in a little island state out here in Idaho. I'm, I'm like in the middle of a desert, okay? There's no other technicians for me to go that are in my town or even in my state for me to go learn from. Not that are common knowledge to me, and especially not in the bigger, higher power classes. So, you gotta remember guys, there's two forms of knowledge, book smart and street smarts. I found street smarts will make you get through the world a lot easier than book smarts will. You've got the guys that are the legends, you know, the ghost riders, the bluegills, the yellow jackets, the sneaky peats, the slave boys. Those guys were innovators. I mean, how blue go Pete had a 4CX5000 with grid and bias running in the mobile in the 80s. Think about that for a second. He's got a 12 volt power source and he's running grid, screen, and bias on a 4CX5000 in the mobile. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm not saying that any of the other technicians don't know how to do that. Not going there. I'm not starting that rumor. I'm just saying these are, these are the, innovate, the style of innovative tricks, and I'm using him as an example, that I want to go learn. I want to learn those knowledge, that, that basis, that book of knowledge. That's my hunt. That's my drive. I want to find these guys and go learn everything I can from them. The Skullcracker, Prime Minister, Shockwave, my good friend Donald, good teacher of mine. Prime, good teacher of mine. I mean, just to give you an example, I had some problems. Let me mute my phone. Because this guy does not get, he's not the only one in the universe. We're just going to put you on mute. I had a problem with my 15,000 when I first put it together. And I called my little circle of guys and nobody had ever experienced that problem before. And, you know, believe it or not, a lot of us don't talk shit about each other. It doesn't do us any good. And what none of us really care. It's just, there's no point in saying anything negative about another builder. There's no point in it. You'll find that the people that are around builders, though, have a tendency to speak their own opinions on things and they say a bunch of negative shit. Um, I mean, it, <laughs> there's a lot of drama and controversy that comes from that. But me being in the position that I am in now, I was able to call some people and the only person that had encountered this problem before, he listened to me talk, he goes, oh yeah, I know exactly what that is. I called like five or six other people before him. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I know exactly what that is. And he proceeded to tell me, if you take this and do this and do this, it'll stop and this is what's causing it. Boom, had that knowledge in my head. And that was 418. It's an accumulative source of knowledge. And the more people I can be around or be associated with or having a working relationship with, the better off we're all going to be. In the beginning when I started this journey, nobody wanted to teach me nothing. It's something as simple as like a, a two-pill 2879 box, I'd call and ask another technician a question, man, you don't know shit, you need to quit this. So I made it my goal the more knowledge I have, the more I would share and the more I'd use it to teach 
to help offset that negativity. Because I noticed in the radio community, the negativity in the radio community was killing it. At least out here in the Northwest. I don't know what was going on in the rest of the country. I can only not reference my corner, my little hunk of it. There was this attitude, this mentality, this ugliness that was running around here up here in the Northwest. I know and you don't know, that makes you stupid. Is that really what makes me stupid? No, it makes you stupid for having that mentality, is the way I look at it. Knowledge is free, and that's why I spend so much time on the phone helping people with their projects. I digress, let's get back on task. Motorola handbooks, get yourself a decent ARRL handbook. Now, let's go talk about lineage of knowledge. I was on the phone with my friend Chris at BM Technologies, the prodigal son of Dave Maine. And he says, man, we were talking about tubes. He says, man, there's a, a biasing circuit I really want to go try and look at and maybe build it someday. It was in one of the books that William I. Orr wrote. I said, who? I love books. I love books. I love paper reference. Yes, they take up a lot of space. Yes, they're very heavy. I like books. I'm a product of the 70s and 80s. I like books. I mean, the internet, you can get anything you want off of it. I like books. And it comes in handy for when you're wanting to show somebody on paper. There was this gentleman. His name was William I. Orr, otherwise known as Bill Orr. And there's bunches of web pages dedicated to this guy. And that's William, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, space, I period, Orr, O-R-R. Now, from what I can read about this man, he was never an engineer. But because of him, we get to enjoy a vast sum of knowledge. This is the 20th edition. This is a precursor to the ARRL handbook. This is the radio handbook, the 20th edition. There's a 3CX circuit in here and how to control it. That's the reason I have this particular version of this book. It is the precursor to this. He had a way to take incredibly complex things, his gift to the radio world and his legacy that he leaves behind is he had the gift of being able to take complex problems or complex engineering and make it so that everybody could understand it and explain it in such a way that people could easily digest it and learn it. Which if you stop and think about it, is an incredibly powerful tool. I mean, that's, that's an incredibly powerful tool. So, William worked for iMac. We're gonna circle back to that in a minute. For decades. And he worked with the ARRL, helping write a lot of the books and teaching literature that they had. And this is all very well documented. What I'm telling you now is something that you can easily go reference and look up on Google. Um, the guy was innovative in the standpoint that he wanted to take everything that he could go learn from people and put it onto paper and put it in a way that we could learn. This is another good book. This is, an, this is the 22nd edition. Once again, there's a lot of repeat of knowledge between here, here, and here. If you throw out all the rules and regs and all the different whatever standards that are in here and the knowledge that you need to have to become an amateur operator, this book gets really small. It gets to be about that big. And they change that little hunk of knowledge from book, from book to book, year to year. That's what makes them different. This one's got a little 3CX project in it I wanted to play with. This one's got a 4CX project in it. You'll notice that the books are roughly the same size. But they've taken some of the knowledge that was in this book and they've dropped it and they've replaced it with new stuff and they put it in this book, roughly the same format. Those are powerful books to look at. Precursor, William Moore. So, I go to a Conco. No, let's skip over that. Let's come back to that. This binder was gifted to me um, from a gentleman that lived down the street from another guy. His name was Kelly. 
Um, the gentleman spent a lot of his lifetime working for, we'll just say the government, and working on communications for the government. And he collected a lot of different books. And this is one of the books that he, one of the three ring binders that he gifted me that is full of different internal manuals on different styles of amplifiers, newsletters. You'll find that these newsletters, most of them were written by or the department that he oversaw or he operated for, IMAC, AKA God, here in the United States in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And towards the 90s, IMAC was on its way down and it's a shadow of what it was today. They had a huge engineering division that allowed them to research pretty much anything they wanted to do with RF. Um, being a, now a subdivision of Raytheon and much bigger corp, um, it, it's, it's a shadow of what it was for 40 years. But once again, this guy here set the standard so that we all get to have the knowledge. This this particular three ring manual has got a, or binder has got a bunch of information about satellite communication and RF amplification for the upper frequency, two meters, 70 centimeters, how to stack beams, the math that's involved with all of that stuff. Most of this knowledge is kind of skimmed over in this book, but this is the in-depth breakdown of what is what and how it's set up and the theorem behind it, the idea of, okay, we you want to go make such and such thing work? Here's a good starting point. Remember that, that train of thought that I'm on. This is a good starting point. This is the iMac Master tool, uh, Tube Manual, volume number one. This is the one that covers all the three CX tubes that uh, iMac ever built up to the 90s is in here. These are full-blown, fold-out data sheets. So when you guys go look up the PDFs on the internet and you're looking at a PDF and you're thinking about something, I come out here and I get the full-blown data sheet and I look at it in a paper format. It's easier for my little brain to digest it. I don't know why, it just is. So like when I have a transformer built, I get a print like this. Electronic product design. Primary, secondary is what it is. Five volt, 30 amp. I get prints like this and I start throwing them in my three ring binder. I got another whole three ring binder that's all full of my own prints. I don't know how this one ended up in here and actually need to put that in that other binder. Set that aside. There's three or four editions of this. I'm not on the hunt for those. They're all over the place. And the only reason I know that there's more than this manual, I've got this one here. I picked this up at a local yard sale here. I paid $5 a piece for these, I think. This is the iMac tube reference manual, volume number two. This is 4CX and 5CX tubes. And that's just, that's just the tubes, data sheets. It's not their suggested cabinet designs and all that other stuff. Here's the data sheet for my tube that's in my box right now. YC278, otherwise commonly known as a 3CX40007. That goes in volume number one. I'll put that back when we're completed here. I am on the tour at iMac, or Conco. And I was lucky enough and privileged enough to go in and be able to get to meet their head engineer that was there. And I had a big yellow leaf pad that I'd filled full of a whole bunch of notes that I wanted to ask this guy. And when I was there, I wanted to film, right? I, and what I mean when I want to film is, here's the basic tube construction. Here's I'm running it into the kiln. This is I'm putting a vacuum on it. These are how the getters work. Very quick little snippets. I was totally approved for that. The day before I get there, they call me up and said corporate killed it. And I had a stack 
of questions that I wanted to ask this guy at a Conco, the company that rebuilds all of these tubes. You know, questions like, what's the proper procedure for actually getting, in, getting a tube from you guys as a new remanufactured? What is a suggested startup procedure? What are the things that we should look for when we're starting up the tube? How do we go about providing these kind of tests? Right? I had a big yellow pad of questions I was going to sit down and ask this guy. It never got to happen. Corporate said no. And I can understand why from a certain point of view. From another point of view, that knowledge has now gotten to be lost. It's kind of sad. It is what it is. But I asked him. I walked into his office and I was able to shake his hand. Nice guy. Had some very big problem on his shoulder that day because he was a little stressed out about something. I don't know what it was. But I asked him, I said, did you happen to meet? You know, because he told me he'd worked at IMAC for like 20 years. I said, did you ever know or get to meet Willie Moore? He goes, who? And I said, oh no, never mind. It's just one of the guys that worked at IMAC that I have a lot of respect for. And I just thought maybe you'd be able to tell me a little bit about him. It's fascinating to me. This guy created himself a whole division just in documentation and how to go about putting things together for the rest of us to continue to enjoy. He was the one that basically laid down the blueprint for a lot of these books. He wasn't the end all bees knees and did it all, but these books, these manuals, all of this stuff. I looked behind him and he had probably four of these and they were filthy from where he'd been grabbing them and put, pulling them on and off the shelf for decades. Those were his Bibles. And he didn't know who wrote them. I was like, okay. Brilliant man. Incredibly smart man. Absolutely not trying to take anything from him whatsoever. Please, for the love of God, do not take what I just said here as me saying something negative. I just, I thought it was interesting. I mean, he knew, he knew all the names because, you know, he'd been in the business. He just didn't know who wrote their books. I, just thought, I was like, okay. I'm going to leave you guys with this. This is a great little quick read. Beam and Tenna Handbook by William I. Orr. This sold for $2.70 back in the day. I think I paid 25 cents for this on eBay. This is a great knowledge book. This book explains to us in no short disorder and this is just a very light read. I mean, compared to this or these, this is a small, single print, nice big words. Ah, the medium array, the array, transmission line, matching devices, uh, parasitic beam, operational characteristics of parasitic beam, design of parasitic arrays, antenna construction, all metal arrays, <clears throat> antenna construction, composite arrays, otherwise the mix of fiberglass or other non-conductive like wood, antenna systems, um, Antenna elevation. This is really important that you might want to take a look at this, this section here. The antenna elevation and how it actually goes and plays in propagation patterns. Uh, your actual antenna measuring test equipment and antenna installation basic rule of thumb guide. This book here is a short reference Bible for beam builders. I'm telling you, the math that's in here is completely tested and is 100% bulletproof. There is no black magic to making antennas work. It has been tested and the principles have been proven a million times. This right here, this right here, and it's all condensed in this little handbook. This portion of this, this book is in here. A large hunk of it is in this handbook. And it's in this handbook, and it's in this handbook, and I'm pretty sure it's in the 2020 edition, although I have not seen a handbook or bothered to look at one since 2010. I don't care what's in there. I know the communication rules have changed a lot. I, knew they're, I know they're doing a lot of data communication these days. This might be something if you're an antenna guy and you're really interested in how antennas actually work, beam antennas, or you want to be an antenna designer, this is something you definitely want to pick up and use as a reference. The modeling software since the 1990s to today, um, you got programs like QI4 and EasyNEC and so on, those are dinosaurs 
compared to the modeling programs that they have out today for antenna design. But when you boil it down, all of those programs operate on the math, the basic math that's in here. Food for thought. This is another quick reference guide that I have located in my walk through this business. Uh, this is a tube selection handbook and what this comes in handy for is, um, let's say I got a 6H58 tube. Well, what does that cross with? What will it actually physically socket into and what are good replacements for those and have a good cross? This is my sweep tube hand reference manual that I keep around. This is the RCA sweep tube cross reference uh, receive manual technician series 21. I've had this one for a long time. And in here is everything you'd ever need to know about any receive tube and any of the old Collinses, um, all the old radios. All those tubes are in here. These are the data sheets for those tubes. And then also in the backs is a small uh, appendix of cross-reference replacement tubes. This is the 1972 edition uh, tube transistor substitution guide reference. This is exactly what you think it would be. Just a bunch of numbers and digis. The reason I collect this stuff or have this handy is so that when somebody says, I've got a six KDN six or 3135, whatever, whatever, I can grab this book real quickly. Like, Oh, I know where that's at. Go grab the book while I'm on the phone, pull it up and go, Oh, a 30 PHL that crosses and then it'll usually pop up with a number that I know and I understand what it's going to cross to. And this gives me a quick reference. You try to go look this up on the internet. First, you got to go find somebody that's got the data for that tube and all they're going to give you is the actual data sheet. They're not going to give you a cross reference guide. There's a little small index of transistors that's in here. There's been more transistors produced than I mean, if I was to get out a book that had a cross reference for most of the transistors, I had one, it was, I called it the big red ugly book that wouldn't fit on a shelf. It was about that thick. It was about this wide and it was about that deep. And that was in the eighties and it was red, it was uglier than shit. I mean, it looked like a tabletop Gideon Bible. It was unbelievable. And that's so out of date. It's not even funny. So now I just rely on the internet for that. But these are some of the basic basic books that you can accumulate that's going to allow you to start working on things. A decent old, a decent old handbook that you can pick, usually pick up for pennies on the dollar on the internet will get you a very, very, very good first step into the front door of doing radio amateur, or amplifier radio repair. It's just a starting reference point. Okay, as a closing thought, I want to put this out there for those of you that have struggled through watching this video, because it's, it's not all that entertaining. Book learning is not never and never has been entertaining, just like math. Math is never easy for anyone. You got to do it and do it some more and do it some more, and then you learn the math. It's, it, just, it sucks, but it is what it is. If you go and get yourself a book, and you sit down and you read and you digest that manual. There is a huge difference between book smarts and street smarts. Okay, in this application, in this world of radio, you've got theorem guys and you've got the doers, the primes, the shockwaves, the, the sneaky peats, the bluegills, the ghost riders, the slave boys of the time, the doers, the doers always have more information in their heads than the book guys. This, the way I look at this thing, is a basic rule book. There's basic rules in here. What is a resistor? What is Ohm's law? What is voltage? What is amperage? Those are all rules. Okay. Street smarts 
are the guys that went out and took these rules and put them into practical applications and then watched shit break and sat down and figured out why. Gonna give this to you as a suggestion. Do not go and learn something in the book and then walk around and act like you're Moses carrying around the Ten Commandments. You're gonna have massive repercussions from that. Usually, most of it is socially based repercussions because nobody wants to be around that guy. Nobody. And nobody wants to be around the rule Nazi either. Let those things go. Enjoy electronics for what they are. Understand what the rules are. Because remember, it's like in the Matrix. It really is. The guys that are the doers, the street smart guys that are working on things, they learn. There are some rules that you can't break. There's other rules you can bend a little bit and massage. And there's other rules that can be broken. I'm going to end on this note. I'm going to put this challenge out to every single one of you guys that are radio operators. I don't care if you're an amateur operator or a CB operator. If you've got somebody in your town that's an older operator, I want you to stop and take a minute and I task you with this. I challenge you with the idea that you should stop and at least check on that guy at least or that person at least once a month. Just go physically check in on them. Do at least one thing a month that will help keep that guy 10-8 and on the air and enjoying the hobby. Believe me, we're all getting older every single day. The hobby's getting smaller every single day and we have to help take care of each other and keep each other on the air. That's just the way this is going to roll out. Because I guarantee you that when we all get old, we pray that there's somebody around that's going to be able or willing to come help us keep our radio hobby going for us. And the least you can do is try and extend that courtesy to others. This year, towards the end of this year, and into the next year, I'm going to be doing more of what I call the spoken word tour. You guys got a little taste of that with the motor mouth video. You all really enjoyed that video. I want to go find some of these other technicians and I want to sit down with them and say, please tell me your story. And I want to get that. And it doesn't have to be, I'm going to immediately go run it out and put it on YouTube. That's probably not what's going to happen whatsoever. I want to get the knowledge that they have in their head and I want to hear their history and their point of view on how things happened. I hate revisionist history. I hate it. So I've discovered that it's easier for me to go to the source and learn from them and have it documented and so we can start spreading the truth on who really did what and how this happened and how that happened. Just to give you an example, I would love to sit down and interview Muscle Man. Muscle, muscle, muscle. First guy over 200 transistors in the mobile. And get his history and his thoughts on how things were put together and why they worked. I'd love that. And I want to do that more. So I'm going to start reaching out to some of these guys. I don't know how many, too many of them are going to be too open for it. Because we've lived, this big RF power portion of our community has lived in the shadows for decades and decades and decades and decades. But I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to bring you more entertainment like the Motor Mouth Mall video and more of the, the oral history of our hobby. Gentlemen, if you got a question or anything I can do to help you, call me. There's my number. I appreciate every single one of you guys and gals that tune in and watch and follow along. And hopefully this video will help answer some of the books and reference materials that I keep around here for myself and maybe the beginnings of how you can go about learning or teaching yourself to work on and repair things 
in this community, at least from the amplifier side of things. Good night. We'll see you again.